What about consciousness? The C word, do, what, do you think that's fundamental to solving AGI or is it a quirk of human cognition? So I think most of the arguments about consciousness don't have a whole lot of merit. Uh, I think that consciousness is kind of the way the brain feels when it's operating. Uh, and, <laughs> yes. And this idea that, you know, I do generally subscribe to sort of the pandemonium theories of consciousness where there's all these things bubbling around. And I think of them as kind of slightly randomized, sparse distributed memory bit strings of things that are kind of happening, recalling different associative memories. And eventually you get some level of consensus and it bubbles up to the point of being a conscious thought there. And the little bits of stochasticity that are sitting on in uh, in this as it cycles between different things and recalls different memory, that's largely our imagination and creativity. Um, so I don't think there's anything deeply magical about it, certainly not symbolic. I think it is generally the flow of these uh, associations drawn up with stochastic, stochastic noise overlaid on top of them. And I think so much of that is like it depends on what you happen to have in your field of view as some other thought was occurring to you that overlay and blend into the next key that queries your memory for things. And that kind of determines how, you know, how your chain of consciousness goes. So that's kind of the qualia, the subjective experience of it is not is not essential for intelligence. I don't think so. I don't think there's anything really important there. What about some other human qualities like fear of mortality and stuff like that? Like um the fact that this ride ends, is that is that important? Like you, you, you know, we've talked so much about this conversation about the value of deadlines and constraints. Um, do you think that's important for intelligence? That's actually a super interesting angle that uh, that I don't usually take on that about has death being a deadline that forces you to make better decisions. Yes. Because I have heard people talk about how if you have immortality, people are going to stop stop trying and working on things because they've got all the time in the world. I yeah. am. Um, but I would say that I don't expect it to be a super critical uh, thing that uh, that a sense of mortality and death, impending death, is necessary there because those are things that they do wind up providing reward signals to us, and we will be in control of the reward signals. And there there will have to be something fundamental that causes that engenders curiosity and goal mm-hmm. setting and all of that. I am um, something is going to play in there at the reward level. I am. Um, you know, whether it's positive or negative or both, I don't have any strong opinions on exactly what it's going to be. I, but that's that type of thing where I doubt that might be one of those half dozen key things that has to be sorted out on exactly what the master reward that's the meta reward over all of the, hmm. uh, the local task specific rewards have to be. That could be that big negative reward of death. Maybe not death, but ability to walk away from an interaction. So it bothers me when people treat AI systems like servants. So it, it doesn't bother me, but I mean, it, it's, it really is drawing the line between what an AI system could be. It's limiting the possibility of what an AI system could be. It's treating them as just as tools. Now that's of course, for, from a narrow AI perspective, there's so many oh, problems that narrow AI could solve, just like you said, as in in its form of of a tool, but it could also be a, a being, uh, which is much more than a tool. And to be a to become a being, you have to respect that thing for being a being, and f- for that, it has to be able to have um, to make its own decisions, to walk away, to say, "I had enough of you. I would like to break up with you now. Uh, you've not treated me well, and I would like to move on." <laughs> so uh, I think that actually that choice to end things. So I, I a couple of things on that. So on the one hand, I, it is kind of disturbing when you see people being like people that are mean to robots and, you know, mean to Alexa and whatever. And that seems to speak badly about humanity. But there's also the exact opposite side of that, where you have so many people that imbue humanity in inanimate objects or things that are toys or that are, are relatively limited. So I think there may even be more more danger about people putting more emotional investment into a lot of these proto AIs in different ways. Yeah. Um, and then the AI would manipulate that. But you but know, as far as like the AI me, ethics me, sides of things, yes. I 
really stay away from any of those discussions or even really thinking about it. It's similar with the safety things where I think it's just premature. And there's a certain class of people that enjoy thinking about impractical things, things that are not in the world and you know, of pragmatic effect around you. And I think that, begin again, because I don't think there's going to be a fast takeoff. I think we actually will have time to have these debates when we know the shape of what we're debating. And some people do take a principled approach that they think it's going to go too fast, that you really do need to get ahead of it, that you need to be thinking about this because we have slow processes of coming to any kind of consensuses or even coming up with ideas about this. And maybe that's uh, maybe that's true. Uh, I wouldn't put any of my money or funding into something like that because I don't think it's a problem yet. And I think that we will have these signs of life. When when we've got our learning disabled toddler, we should really start talking about some of the safety and ethics issues, but probably not before then. Can you elaborate briefly about why you don't think there'll be a fast takeoff? Is there some deep intuition you have about it? Is it so because the, it's grounded in the physical world or why? Yeah, so... It is my belief that we're going to start off with something that requires thousands of GPUs. And I uh, I don't know if you've tried to go get a thousand GPU instance on a cloud anytime recently, but these are not things that you can just go spin up hundreds of. I, there are real challenges to, I mean, these things are going to take data centers and data centers take years to build, you know, and the last few years, we've seen a few of them kind of coming up, going in different places. They're big engineering efforts. You can hear people bemoan about the fact that I know oh, the, the network was wired all wrong and it took them a month to go unwire it and rewire it the right way. These aren't things that you can just magic into existence. And the ideas of I, like the old tropes about it's going to escape onto the internet and take over other systems – there's the fast takeoff ones are clearly nonsense because you just can't open TCP connections above a certain rate. No matter how smart you are, even if you have perfect hacking ability, that take over the world in an instant sort of thing just isn't plausible at all. And even if you had access to all of the resources, these are going to be specialized systems where you're going to wind up with something that is architected around exactly this chip with this interconnect. And it's not just going to be able to be plopped somewhere else. Now, interestingly, it is going to be something that the entire um, the entire code for all of it will easily fit on a thumb drive. That's mm-hmm. total spy movie thriller sorts of things where you could have, hey, we cracked the secret to AGI and it fits on this thumb drive and mm-hmm. anyone could steal it. Now, they're still going to have to build the right data center to deploy it and have the right kind of life experience curriculum to take it up to the point where it's valuable. But the real core of it, the the magic that's going to happen there is going to be very small. You know, it's, again, tens of thousands of lines of code, not millions of lines of code. It is possible to imagine a world, as you mentioned in the spy thriller view, if it's if it's just a few lines of code, we can imagine a world where the surface of computation is growing, maybe growing exponentially, meaning there's, you know, the ref- the refrigerators start getting a GPU. And uh, just, every, first of all, the smartphones, the billions of smartphones, but maybe if there become highways through which code can spread across the entirety of the computation surface, then you don't any longer have to book AWS um, GPUs. There are real fundamental issues there. When you start getting down to taking an actual problem and putting it on an abstract machine like that, Mm -hmm. that has not worked out well in practice. And the idea that there was always... Like, it's always been easy to come up with ways to get com- compute faster, say more flops or more uh, more giga ops or whatever there. That's usually the easy part. But you then have interconnect and then memory for what goes into it. And when you talk about saying, well, cell phones, well, you're limited to like a 5G connection or something on that. And if you say how, if you take your your calculation and you factor it across a million cell phones instead of uh, a thousand GPUs in a warehouse. Mm -hmm. You might be able to have some kind of a substrate like that, but it could be operating then at one one thousandth the speed. And so, yes, you could get, you could have an AGI working there, but it wouldn't be a real time AGI. It would be something that is operating at really a snail's pace, you know, much, much slower than kind of human level thought for things. I'm not worried about that problem. You're transferring the problem into the interconnect, the communication, the shared memory, 
the, the the collective intelligence aspect of it, which is extremely difficult as well. Yeah, I mean, it's back to the the very earliest days of supercomputers. You still have the the balance between bandwidth storage and computation, and sometimes they're easier to get one or the other, but it's been remarkably constant across all those years that you still need all three. 